So, in this video, I'll try to interpret the lore of one of the two new artifact sets called Obsidian Codex. I won't read every single word from the artifact descriptions in this video, but I mention the lines I think are important, and I'll try to put the original text on the screen when it matters. I always start with the short description first, and then go over the rest of the lore. And just as I implied at the very start of this video, this is just my interpretation of the lore as I understand it, and although I would say that I am quite a lore nerd, I can still make mistakes, so please be aware of that. I should also make it clear that I have only briefly read the lore of the scroll of the hero of Cinder City, and I haven't done all of the work quests in Nathan just yet, so maybe I'll miss something in this analysis. But with all of that out of the way, let's get into the lore of the Obsidian Codex artifact set. So, Reckoning of the Xenogenic, aka the Flower of Life, is described as a flower meticulously carved from black crystal. It emits a mysterious light at night. It talks about the times when the divine envoys fell into the realms devoid of light, probably meaning the abyss, and the ruler destroyed the blasphemous citadel. This ruler should be the pirate dragon sovereign, or the black winged dragon, who apparently defeated the divine envoys and attacked what is implied to be Erminsul in one of the ancient murals. So the pirate sovereign supposedly survived the war with the heavenly principles that we already know about from before Sun and Moon and other sources. However, he was corrupted by the abyss and forbidden knowledge, and since we know that the Dragon King Nibelung used both of these powers, it all makes a lot of sense. But it's still interesting that the Pyro Seven supposedly survived the war. The rest of the bishops who were lucky enough to survive after the war with the Divine enjoyed the freedom by the grace of the one who ruled over the flames. Who I think in this case again is the Dragon King Xiuquatl, I hope I am pronouncing this correctly, who was the Pyro Dragon Sovereign. But the wisdom of fire had already been seized by darkness, which probably means that it was corrupted by the forbidden knowledge and the abyss. And only its grey corpse shambled on. So to maintain the dragon kind's might, they chose violence over the rule of law. In this land that would soon vanish, only one human gazed toward the future. I believe that this refers to Shabalanke, the first Pyro Archon. Then it's followed by something that sounds like a dialogue, more so than a monologue, said by someone who is in my opinion highly implied to be the Sage of the Stolen Flame, a dragon whose other name is Vashaklahun Uba Khan. I'm sorry for my pronunciation if I said this wrong. Maybe he had a conversation with Shabalanke, who was the first Pyro Archon and who also later defeated the Pyro Dragon Sovereign I spoke about, and ascended to the Divine Throne of Celestia, or it could be just a monologue. It talks about the dragons and how they are prostrating before the ruler's deathbed, implying that the Dragon King has either already been slain or will soon be slain at this point. It talks about the vision of a great civilization, great wisdom and so on, but all shall perish in the end. And the cycle are the law of the world, and history will not cease on account of our sorrows. Which refers to the cyclical nature of Teyvat, that is at this point referenced multiple times throughout the lore, mainly by the Narsenkreuz Ordo, which suspected the existence of multiple Samsara cycles, and said that we are currently living in the fourth Samsara cycle of Teyvat. Everything basically repeats with great civilizations rising and then falling again and again. You could see this with Gurabat, Ancient Remuria, and Kanomia, and so on. This is actually very important for Natlan, since this artifact set indirectly talks about the Natlantean, aka the second Samsara cycle of Teyvat, which is stated from a bunch of lore from the Narsenkreuz Ordo, is symbolizing the cycle of a triumph over the evil dragon, as a metaphor for humanity's victory over nature as well as the beasts within themselves. I promise that this will be more important as this video continues. Anyway, from the wording of these lines, it seems like the Sage of the Stolen Flame was the one who foresaw this tragic end to his own race of dragons. Servants today shall be rulers tomorrow, past slaves shall be future's masters. Which really reminds me of what Pakal told us in the Archon Quest about Natlan's progress, something like that the limits of the past become the backrest of the present. Pakal mentioned back then that he was quoting someone else, maybe that someone else was the Sage of the Stolen Flame. Then it continues. Our race is mired in spiraling contradiction inexorable, only in sowing seeds shall we find salvation. This is definitely said by the Sage of the Stolen Flame, because we know that he believed that they could be all saved if they shared their knowledge with other races. In this case, humans. Then the artifact describes how he took a seed from the primal fire, from the volcano, and went to find a land that has yet to know the touch of filth and decay. And we know that when Shabalanke became the Pyro Archon, the Sage created a realm of purity that we can find in one of the war quests in Natlan. And at the end of this artifact description, it is basically revealed that the one this piece talked about was indeed the Sage of the Stolen Flame and calls him the wisest among dragons. The Plume of Death, also called the Root of Spirit Marrow, is described as a feather accessory made in imitation of an ancient dragon's wing. Perhaps it was once a memento of some forgotten history. This could be a feather from the Dragon Sovereign, since its wings are also described as dark. It it talks about the age when Irmitsu was burning in the past, which was caused by the Dragon Sovereign I already spoke of. The Sage of the Stolen Flame traveled the world while carrying the seed from the primal fire, but none of the locations met his expectations. Until one day he discovered the creator's most beloved and yet weakest of species, this creator refers to the primordial one, and they were humans who lived in this land of dragons and lost their guidance, probably because of the fall of the divine envoy. Because he admired their tenacity, unity and courage, he granted them the kindling of wisdom, but this precious gift wasn't without the cost. It was civilized these barbarians, 
but also order their destinies. What he brought to them wasn't salvation but evolution, merging two species and two bloodlines as one and thus creating a new reborn civilization. His goal was to create a union between dragons and humans. Then he said to one of the barbarians that one day there, there will be a savior of two worlds who will slay the dragon sovereign and ascend the oldest of thrones, meaning the divine throne. Next is a sense of Eon, called Myths of the Night Realm, which is described as a mysterious ritual element that is neither a timepiece nor a compass. Nowadays no one has any idea what it is used for. It talks about the times when ancient humans tried to stop the black tide, probably meaning the power of the abyss or forbidden knowledge, with their bodies. About the days when floating land and eternal night still walked separate paths. This line is very interesting because if the floating land refers to Celestia and the eternal night refers to the abyss, that would imply that they joined forces and Celestia became corrupted in the future. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but that's what it sounds like to me. Then it talks about a human called Chuck to the kindling I mentioned in the previous piece from the hands of the Sage of the Stolen Flame and shared it with his tribes people. New sprouts of civilization sprang up once more, but the dragon sovereign still ruled over their land and they didn't realize that the wheel of fate had begun to turn. Legend says that the greatest sage who dwelt in the stillness of the floating land knew the answer to all questions in the mortal world, but he had no answer to two matters, the end of the living and the homeward path of the dead. Perhaps it was that the gods of the night realm ruled over the underworld, implying that the abyss had their own kinds of gods maybe, and they were great foes of the sage. Or perhaps this plan would crumble should the everlasting flame reconnect with the roots of the earth. This probably refers to the primal fire and the ley lines, although I don't know exactly what it implies. Maybe that if the primal fire burned their invincible, his plan would fail? but I don't know why that would happen. Chuck mastered the primal fire and then, with the help of his comrades, defeated the dragon, implying that Chuck should just be another name of Shabalanke. This is a very important turning point not only for Natlan, but for Teyvat as a whole, as implied by the Natsan Kreuz Ordo, and the fact that they classify Natlantean as the second of the four Samsara cycles of Teyvat, and it's symbolized by humanity's triumph over the evil dragon, meaning this exact moment I just talked about. It's actually kinda crazy how it all comes together. After everything was settled, he couldn't defy the verdict passed by time, and one by one, his companions left him. Eventually he climbed a high mountain to ignite the first flame, he called out and the god of the night realm responded. That night the first vibe of the night kingdom was born. It's kind of implied that if Chuck was indeed a Chamblanke, he died in that moment by entering the sacred flame, which would make sense then why he became the one into in primal fire. It seems to be very similar to what Mavica did after the Kandrian disaster and how she would then later be resurrected in the future. Maybe this is implied that Chamblanke could have had a similar plan and I think that this makes the possibility of him being resurrected in Matlan more likely. Then we move on to the goblet, which is called the pre-banquet of the contenders, and is described as a vessel that seems to have been made by twisting and forming stone in a seemingly whimsical fashion. But it is an open question as to who possesses such strength. It talks about the age where Natlan's heroes fought each other for conquest. When all of these tragedies were happening, only the Sage of the Stolen Flames stood within the stagnant void and acted as a silent observer of this grand, drawn-out tragedy. He believed that the strongest among the humans would become a hero who drew all human tribes dwelling atop the black stone. On that day, the living corpse on the throne would spit forth flame that could stain the sky red, and the new king would receive the primal fire as a tribute to them for ascension. The power sovereign ruled from the city deep wells that even gods had yet to conquer. It knew that the foes in the shadows were not far off, and it knew that neither gods in their heavens, nor the hiking among dragons, meaning it belong, would suffice. All knowledge and strength had to be gathered before that day came. Only this way could his stubborn kin awaken from their ancient shattered dreams of a decrepit king, and the ancient civilization would welcome suitable successors and find its footing. Circle the of logos called the crown of the stains is described as a crown made of obsidian that in ancient times was used in coronation ceremonies by noble tribal kings. It describes an era when the dark tide of filth, again probably meaning the forbidden knowledge, arose from the sky's edge and the heroes of Natan marched together. And like that the ancient dragons became extinct and the era of the ancients ended. This was an era where the war chiefs of the tribes stopped slaying dragons and decided to fight for supremacy. And from these dark lands rose a king that wore this crown woven from golden flowers and wielded a blade from obsidian. And he visited one tribe after another. Under the sun's radiance, the tribes made a pact of armistice, and they laid their arguments aside and offered him the crown. Probably meaning that under the guidance of their new archon, aka the sun, they decided to stop fighting among themselves and unite instead. And that's the end of all the lore of the Obsidian Codex artifact set. But that will be it for the lore of this artifact set, and there is obviously more to it than just the things I spoke about, but there is still a lot I don't know about Natlan, and a lot that just simply hasn't been answered in the game yet. So all of this has just been my personal in interpretation using the information I know about the lore already, which means that more information about this set will probably become clear once we get more of the lore released. I still haven't gotten to a lot of the new lore that was released in Natlan, so please forgive me if I missed something. I hope I didn't make any huge misinterpretation in this video, but with all of that said, I hope you enjoyed this video and I see you in the next one so please take care.